Test, 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 Mike, test, 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 Mike, test, 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 okay. Test, 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 Mike. Test, test. Test, Mike. Test, test, test. Okay, welcome everyone and welcome to those of you who are watching this either live or recorded. My name is Pam Pearson. I'm the director of the International Cryosphere Climate Initiative and it is my great pleasure to be broadcasting to you from Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt from the COP27 Cryosphere Pavilion. Uh, I really want to start by giving a great hand to our wonderful technical crew who have been struggling to get us online. So please, this is for you. Um, today, the COP is just getting started. Uh, there are plenary sessions moving and we're using the opportunity of our wonderful group of early career scientists, volunteers, who will be working at the pavilion all week to have them introduce their own research and maybe what brought them to science uh, and caused them to begin focusing on these different cryosphere dynamics. Um, I'll also like to put in a plug for a the release of the State of the Cryosphere 2022 report that will be out tomorrow evening at uh, 6 p.m. Egypt time, and we have a very special event scheduled for that. Um, so our first speaker talking about his science is James Kirkham. Kirkham, sorry, James. James Kirkham from the British Antarctic Survey. Uh, he actually has done extensive field work, including on issues related to adaptation, uh, sustainability and water resources in Nepal and the Himalayan region, but his current research focuses more on Antarctica and sea level rise, the Antarctic ice sheet. So without further delay, James, we're looking forward to hearing about your research. Welcome.
Thank you very much, Pam. And hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to do the first talk here at the Cryosphere Pavilion at COP27 this year. So as Pam said, my name is James Kirkham, and I am a PhD student just finishing up at the British Antarctic Survey and the University of Cambridge in the UK. And today I'm going to talk to you about why it's important to understand the past when trying to predict how ice sheets are going to change in the future. So I grew up on a small family farm in the UK and from an early age I was engrossed with nature and was fascinated by how the world works. And so this kind of seeded the early ideas of science and nature which can be found in no better place than the cryosphere. Over the years I've had the privilege of working in some of the most beautiful, remote and rapidly changing environments on Earth. So this could include the Himalayas region, working at high altitude in the mountains, understanding how the snow is melting high up and goes downstream to provide water for billions of people in this region. I've also seen how humans are affecting the cryosphere rapidly today. So this image here shows a cloud of dust being brought up from India and other parts of Asia, created by vehicle emissions and pollution. And all this pollution rains down on the, sur the surface of glaciers, darkening them and enhancing their melt rates. I've also worked in Antarctica, so in particular Thwaites Glacier, which is one of the most rapidly changing and concerning glaciers in the world. It's really interesting to work in these regions, and they're incredibly beautiful. And I'm particularly interested in how ice sheets are going to respond to extreme climate change in the future. So this talk is set against the backdrop of striking changes happening in the polar regions today. So Antarctica is losing enough ice to fill two Olympic swimming pools every second, and Greenland about twice that. So by the time I finish this talk today, these two ice sheets would have easily lost enough mass to fill this entire hall with water. We should play. So what you should be seeing now are two videos and they're not working. So there's areas which are melting rapidly in these regions. So in green and on the left here, the entire ice sheet is melting across the surface. This is mostly being driven by rising air temperatures. Whereas in Antarctica, the region in the west, below the peninsula here, is changing most rapidly, mostly due to ocean warming. So understanding the past is really key to predicting the future. So we need to look at these contemporary changes in the context of how ice sheets have changed over the last few thousand years. So this image here shows the world 20,000 years ago when ice covered large parts of North America and also Europe. These ancient ice sheets were located much closer to the equator than today's polar regions, and they melted away due to subtle changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun. Now today, human-induced climate change is now causing the Earth's last remaining ice sheets to melt and these are situated at much higher polar latitudes. We have evidence that these ice sheets are now approaching tipping points, so points of no return, basically. And we know from the past, by the deglaciation of these ancient ice sheets, how these tipping points might play out. So, for example, we can look at how sea level has changed over the last 24,000 years. So from the left of this image, 24,000 years ago to present. And we know from these ancient records that there have been periods of extremely rapid sea level rise where sea level rose by over 18 meters in just 500 years. That's almost half a meter every single decade. So we're looking at how these ancient ice sheets melted away in the past. We're able to use them as analogs for how today's ice sheets could melt away in the future. 
So in my own research, I've been focused on one of the greatest uncertainties about how ice sheets respond to climate change, and that is the role of water. So in Greenland today, we see enormous lakes and rivers formed by the melting of ice on the ice sheet surface, and there's a person you can see here for scale. We're now at a stage where there are periods where the whole surface of the Greenland ice sheet melts for multiple days a year. In Antarctica, we have a similar position, although not as extreme. Here, melting on the surface tends to be confined to the fringes of the ice sheet, but we can still see these spectacular waterfall features flowing over ice shelves in cascades. And these features are absolutely spectacular. Now, ice sheets have incredibly complex and interconnected plumbing systems, and that means that water that melts on the surface of the ice can make its way through the ice to the realm underneath the ice itself. And this is really important because that water flowing underneath the ice and above the rock in which the ice rests helps to lubricate the flow of the ice towards the ocean and regulate the rate at which this ice eventually contributes to sea level rise. So water is therefore incredibly important in determining how ice sheets flow and will eventually drive sea level rise in the future. And so this begs the question, if these massive melting events are already happening today, how are these ice sheets going to respond when faced by climatic warming predicted in the future in scenarios such as here, here, or here? We need to understand how the plumbing systems of today's ice sheets are going to respond to extreme climatic warming in the future. The problem is that the polar regions are some of the most inhospitable environments to work in on Earth. So here, temperatures can regularly drop beneath minus 60 degrees Celsius in winter. Winds can whip up to hurricane force speeds. And the weather can change rapidly from brilliant sunshine to a raging storm. Satellites can give us answers, and they've yielded some amazing discoveries. So for example, you can now see how patterns of ice flows on the ice sheet. And this video, if it were to play, would show this live. We can also see that lakes on the surface of the ice sheet can drain rapidly into a matter of hours, transporting vast amounts of meltwater under the ice. So these, math these methods are absolutely fascinating, highly our entire and we then get to this green line see here is the king observations past they used to sheet
And so in some channels, we find these features called eskers, which are the remains of all the water flowing under the ice and clogging up with sediment. And this can tell us how the water was flowing. The ice fractures pushing down the muds the ice rests on. Ice sheets today. Now, these features are incredibly small usually, so it's quite amazing we see there. And the important thing is that they're formed by ice which surges, and that has experienced rapid phases in which the ice flows rapidly forwards and then stagnates and stops. So, clearly, we've got a link between all this water being generated under a melting ice sheet and how ice sheets can actually rapidly accelerate. In other valleys, we're able to see these small pits formed by icebergs floating around and being locked up in the sediment. And in some data sets, we also find these elongated ridges flowing away from these ancient valleys, just streamlined by the flow of the ice. And that helps us to reconstruct how fast the ice was flowing in response to this massive phase of melting beneath it. So why do all these landforms matter for? Well, we can see similar landforms emerging from our ice sheets today as they retreat. And this allows us to go back in time and link the presence of these landforms to the behavior of the ice which formed them. This then allows us to work out how ice sheets in the future might respond to increased atmospheric warming. So when we looked at this, we found two contrasting patterns of observations. Some features appear to actually stabilize the ice, whereas many others appear that when ice sheets start to rapidly, they actually speed up and flow faster. So we then began to ask, well, are these ancient channels relevant for modern ice sheets? And if so, how quickly will they form in the future? And so we went back to our amazing data, and we looked carefully again. And we began to see smaller networks of channels inside them. And in fact, these structures are quite common inside the valleys, if we're able to see them properly. But to scale this up, we used a model of how the last ice sheet to cover the UK grew and melted away during the last ice age. And so what you can see here in blue is an ice sheet growing from 30,000 years ago, UK over the North Sea, and then melting away again. So we used a computer model to work out how much melt water was generated as this ice sheet melted away to inform how quickly these channels could form in the future. And so we conducted experiments to work out how the water would have flowed under the ice, which is shown in this in the colors. So darker areas of reds show where we have lots of water concentrating under the ice, forming these vast rivers which flow to the ice sheet margin. If we zoom in a bit on an area over Denmark, we can see on the left here that all this water propagates through the surface of the ice and then flows into these channels under the ice itself, forming these patterns under the ice sheet. And so when we combine these model simulations with our data from underneath the North Sea, we find quite a striking conclusion. And that is that these valleys form rapidly, fully within just a few hundred years. That may seem like a long time, but we can actively see these valleys forming probably within decades, so within human time scales. So we've discovered a potentially missing process which could help to accelerate the flow of ice sheets in the future. So emphasis now needs to be put onto modeling to try and replicate these features, models of how ice sheets will behave in a way. I want to finish quickly by talking about some implications for a net zero world. And so these ancient glacial features don't just have something to say about ice sheet models, but actually could influence key technologies and methods we might need to achieve net zero in the future. So I talked to you earlier about how our landforms found inside the valleys, these ancient footprints of ice, under the North Sea. This is, uh, many of them 
are also filled with shallow along the features. So this top left image here, we can see in red, pockets of gas trapped inside the ancient, inside these landforms, which are partially connected. To this. And this has a few important implications. So, for example, what this means is that we're trying to install renewable energy, like wind farms, for example, in the North Sea. We there are decaying landforms. That's because you're trying to plant your wind farms into the North Sea, these features, they could really explode, eliminating one of our key renewable infrastructure. As you saw from the slide earlier, these features are incredibly widespread across the world. Notion is that as landforms contain yellow gas deposits, it means that if we're trying to capture and store CO2, in these older, disused oil and gas fields. Well, if there are faults from where these reservoirs were to occur, and we're pumping C2 under the ground, it means that the features pump CO2 under the earth, around, and then escape upwards into the features where they could laterally migrate and then out of the features again. So these ancient glacial landforms for understanding some key technology which could be growing and probably be required to achieve next year in the near-term future. So to conclude, in this talk, I've tried to argue that undoing the past is... From our modeling, we found these tunnel valleys can form rapidly within just hundreds of years and fairly significant versions of them within just decades. So we need to actually incorporate these rapidly into ice sheet models of how ice sheets would evolve in the future today. From the delicate footprints we've imaged inside them, we found that tunnel valleys can both potentially stabilize or destabilize ice sheets in a warming world. So scientists now need to start incorporating these features into models of how ice sheets will evolve in the future. Finally, renewable infrastructure and carbon and capture for storage plans must also take into account our ancient glacial history and trying to work towards a net zero world in the future. So to finish, I'm going to go back to this image again about the tipping points in the Earth's cryosphere. What we know from the past is that the cryosphere can exhibit very, very large and rapid changes that are not necessarily captured by our 40 years of modern satellite observations. These sorts of changes would be devastating for modern society if they were to occur. Every single tenth of a degree of warming that we can prevent makes these tipping points less likely to be crossed and also buys us time to adapt to the changes that we are already locked into achieving. We need to act now. And so the policies put into place at this COP will be key to saving some of the most beautiful and rapidly changing environments on Earth. Let's make these choices the right ones. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll happily answer any questions you may have. Any questions? Ella's up first. Uh, thanks for a lovely talk. I was wondering what kind of complexity of models you would need to incorporate these previously unincorporated processes into your projection. Thanks. That's a really good question. So. The answer is fine scale. So right now, some of the finest, um, switch it off, Ella. Super. Um, so some of the finest models today of how water flows beneath ice sheets are done at about a five kilometer square grid resolution. 
these tunnel valleys can be anywhere between 100 meters wide to a couple of kilometers, and they go everywhere. So we need to really focus on developing these really fine scale models that can accurately represent these sub-grid process scales currently in order to understand how this water affects ice sheet flow. And we can see this today. It's, water is critical in understanding how ice, sheet flow, how ice sheet flows in Greenland and also in Antarctica. And so sub-grid resolution, a few hundred meters will be ideal in the future, which is quite challenging, I know. In the media coverage of the, the paper of the, you know, the channels running under the ice sheet, it was said that it would be similar processes as to what we might, you know, might teach us about Greenland or something like that. Isn't this more close to what we might see in the West on the ice sheet as opposed to Greenland because Greenland is, you know, mass of the dead rock? Yeah, that's a great question. So. The most important thing here is how what's driving the melt. So in West Antarctica, we're not at the stage yet where we have surface melting widespread on the West Antarctic ice sheet. It's still too cold. And most of the really rapid changes that are happening there are driven by the warming ocean, eroding the ice from underneath. Whereas in Greenland, we have days where the whole of the ice sheet surface is now melting. And this generates phenomenal amounts of water. And so it's the transfer of all this surface melt water through the ice, through cracks, through holes on the ice sheet surface to the bed, which we think is really driving the rapid formation of these channels. That being said, West Antarctica sits on, a, in some areas, bedrock and also sedimentary basins, like we found in the North Sea. And so there could be scenarios in the future where if we get enough warming in West Antarctica, similar propagation of surface meltwater to the bed of the ice sheet could happen there too. So it's potentially an analog for Greenland in the near term future and Antarctica somewhere few, a few centuries down the line also potentially too. Any more questions? In that case, I'll wrap up. So thank you very much for listening.